Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly Beatles talk show podcast where we talk about anything we feel like with a Fab Four concern. Their years together, the solo years, their history, their music, anything we feel like in the moment, even what's going on in the news. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm known for several Beatles programs, one of which is a syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing which I've been doing now for 41 years and uh, currently on 50 radio stations. And I also co-host another uh, talk show podcast on the solo careers of the Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I have my own YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with nothing but Beatles content. And I'm being joined by my regular co-hosts on this show. First of all, a man who's been Part of New York Radio, now for 39 years at New York's WFUV, where he's been a fantastic DJ there, playing the music, doing lots of interviews, not believing a word that I'm saying right now, <laughs> but also doing Beatles programs every now and then, Christmas special, I remember, not too long ago, and that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello. Hi, everyone. And also, we have the co-author of the very popular and amazing book that just came out on Paul McCartney, The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, which he co-wrote with Adrian Sinclair, covers the years 1969 through the end of 1973 when Band on the Run came out. Also, the author of uh, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, with his McCartney books, Alan's about to change everything that we know about Paul McCartney. Where do I come up with this? Anyway, Alan Cozen, welcome. <laughs> Again, hello, Darren. Darren the Red Menace. What's up? Yeah, so I don't know what to match the my book, right? That's 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 the. Difference. Oh yeah, that's exa exactly why I'm dressed <laughs> like this. Sure, you dressed up as my book for Halloween. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> hey, that'd be my Halloween costume. I'm Alan's book. Make sure you come to the fest that way. <laughs> Okay, another way to promote the book. On the show this time, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Beatles' very first album in the UK, Please Please Me. Alan has the vinyl, I have the CD. And this I brought nothing. <laughs> Darren has a rock. <laughs> anyway, uh, March 22nd, 1963 is the date when the Beatles' first album came out in the UK. We'll be talking about that. Have a casual conversation, our thoughts about the album 60 years later. But as usual, we have a bit of Beatle news to get to. And we'll start with news about Paul, who just posted a brief video message that with the passing of Jeff Beck, the recent passing, it reminded him of the time that they worked together on a campaign to promote vegetarianism. And this was in 1994. And it also had to do with the danger of destroying the rainforest so it could be used to raise cattle. Jeff Beck had a spoken word message over a music bed with his guitar playing on it. And Paul posted the link if you wanted to go see it. And uh, all you have to do is go to meatfreemondays.com slash 1994 hyphen eco eco message. It's really good. You get to hear Jeff Beck's playing on it, and he says everything you need to know about the campaign in just a couple of minutes. But Paul and Jeff worked on that together. Also, how would you like to jam with Pete Best? You can. The Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, now going on in its 27th year, will have Pete as one of the musicians featured for their summer camp running from July 13th through the 16th, happening at the Cutting Room in New York City. This year will also include Aerosmith's bassist, Tom Hamilton, and the Rolling Stones bassist, Daryl Jones, with more surprise guests coming. The Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp gives music fans a once-in-a-lifetime chance to perform with their musical heroes. To find out more or to sign up, you can go to their website at rockcamp.com. Very cool. Imagine all the Beatle fans that would love to be side by side with uh, Pete Best. From Yahoo.com, we learned that Shout Studios 
has acquired the North American rights to the music documentary Revival 69, the concert that rocked the world, concerning the historic live piece in Toronto show that featured John Lennon and the Plastic Auto Band, directed by Ron Chapman, which just had its U.S. premiere at South by Southwest uh, at their festival in Austin, Texas. The documentary tells the story of the remarkable behind-the-scenes story of how a little-known but life-altering music festival came together against all odds. Young, scrappy concert promoter John Brower puts his life on the line literally to turn his failing Toronto rock and roll revival into a one-day event, and the festival united rock legends like Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Bo Diddley, and Gene Vincent and the doors um but it was the 11th hour arrival of john lennon and the plastic on band that ignited a truly seminal moment for the 20,000 fans at toronto's varsity stadium the film will feature rare behind the scenes material as well as unreleased concert footage shot by d.a pennebaker who also directed the landmark monterey pop festival there are also fresh new interviews with alice cooper Robbie Krieger of the Doors, and uh, I guess not that long ago, uh, Alan White, um, Getty Lee from Rush, Danny Seraphine hmm. from Chicago, and Klaus Vorman. No information yet about a theatrical or a DVD Blu-ray Blu release. All right. Now, this happened two weeks ago, right after we finished our last show, so we didn't get to report this. The very sad news on the passing of drummer Jim Gordon. Mm. In the early part of his career, he was part of the elite group of studio musicians known as the Wrecking Crew. And he became a member of Joe Cocker's Mad Dogs and Englishman Tour, as well as Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. He joined Eric Clapton and Derek and the Dominoes, where they formed at the time of George Harrison's classic album, All Things Must Pass and played on the Apple Jam album. He is credited as co-writer with Clapton for the song Layla, and is said to have written the piano-driven instrumental second half of the song, although this has been disputed, with two members of the group saying it was actually written by Rita Coolidge, Gordon's girlfriend at the time. Gordon also played on George's recording of Try Some Buy Some, playing drums and tambourine, and on George's recording of You, Unfortunately, Jim had a history of mental illness, and in June of 1983, he bludgeoned and stabbed his 72-year-old mother to death, claiming that voices told him to do so. He was diagnosed as having schizophrenia, he was sentenced to 16 years to life in prison, and was denied parole multiple times. Jim Gordon died from natural causes at a California medical facility in Vacaville, California, after a long incarceration and battling mental illness, he died on March the 13th at the age of 77. He was also, um, a couple of years ago, he was a member of Traffic as well after Derek and the Dominoes. Um, he is on the Low Spark of High Heel Boys album as their drummer. I think that might be the only one. Played a lot with Steely Dan uh, after that. And then right. I think just concentrated on session work. But it's a very sad story, the Jim Gordon story, especially as the 70s progressed and his issues were getting worse and worse. Um, you know, that was a sad, sad, sad story. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, we mourn the loss um, right there with Jim Gordon. Uh, with thanks to our listener, Tom Brennan, the progressive rock band Tomorrow that featured Yes guitarist Steve Howe, also Keith West, will have their 1968 self-titled and only album remastered and reimagined as Permanent Dream coming out in April. It'll be released on vinyl and CD, and it includes their cover of Strawberry Fields Forever. A new book now available for pre-order is called Beatlemania Lives On, Super Fans in the 21st Century by Dana Klausner. The book is all about Beatle fandom and how the excitement continues in the 21st century. Conducting nearly 100 interviews with fans across the globe, it takes a deep dive into Beatles-related TV shows, Broadway musicals, movies, businesses, Sirius XM DJs, tribute bands, and more. 
But perhaps most important, and I know Alan's going to be shaken when he hears this news, okay. he's going to be sweating bullets, is that on the front cover of this book, it is sporting a very dapper Darren DeVivo, which means it's going to give uh, Alan a run for his money competing those two books, the McCartney legacy and this one. Dana spoke with me. I mean, I think this was, this might have been before COVID. She's been working on this book a while. She spoke with me uh, and I submitted the photo to her and it was the publisher that liked the photo. It's not just me. Mm. It's me with my daughter, Emily, backstage uh-huh. at Westbury Music Fair or whatever it was called at the time with Ringo Starr. Mm. And uh, I took my daughter backstage at that show. And I think I think she was around 11 years old at the time. Mm-hmm. So um, so it's that family photo. It's really a photograph of that family photo that has now made it onto, onto the cover of a book. So I was thrilled. And it was funny when I showed my daughter. She goes, oh, that's great. <laughs> that's it? You made um, it. So, but it's, it's, I, does it have a publishing date? Because I think it might not be till the end of the year, I thought. I'm told that it's, well, I don't have a date, but no, you, can, think, you can pre order it right now. Dana, I think, told me later in the year. Couldn't be that far away, though, I guess, if they'd taken pre orders. So, okay. So, there's an interview with you in the book? I don't know how it's, I don't know how we, how she, if there's a section with me or if she took bits of all the interviews she did and wrote the book that way and made it just a bunch of quotes. But we spoke a lot on the phone. And I think it was even, like I said, before COVID mm-hmm. um, set in. So uh, it was a while ago. Okay. But well, we'll soon find out. Okay. The first of two books on Mal Evans written by Ken Womack called Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mal Evans, will officially uh, be published on November 14th from Day Street Books. So the release date was pushed back from Father's Day, and now it's November 14th. Also, with thanks to Darren here, I just found out today, uh, there will be a two-day free photo exhibit of May Pang's candid photos of John Lennon called The Lost Weekend, The Photography of May Pang, happening at the Cutting Room in New York City. It's on April the 8th and 9th. May will be there, and you can buy her photos, and she will also be there to sign them. And this will also coincide with the feature film documentary, The Lost Weekend, A Love Story, which will premiere in theaters on April the 13th. If you want to find out where it's showing, you can go to this website, thelostweekendtickets.com. Ken, just very quickly, I noticed you mentioned that the Maypang photo exhibit, the Lost Weekends, at the Cutting Room. It's at City Winery. Just a little, uh, it's the same letter, Cutting, City. Okay. And they're not all that far from each other in Manhattan. But uh, I am on City Winery's website because... Uh, when you said the cutting room, I got like, oh, I had the venue wrong. But it is Saturday the 8th okay. and Sunday the 9th, which is Easter. Um, and that's at City Winery. So, okay, my apologies. It's, so it's, many it's, things are happening at the cutting room lately. <laughs> I think my mind uh, automatically yeah, sure, thinks yeah. that. And then there's also the news about the Fest for Beatles fans. Well, it's happening, of course, this weekend at Hyatt on the Hudson uh friday saturday and sunday we're going to have our own panel the things we said today which will be saturday at 1 p.m there'll be a uh, discussion room called the tell me what you see room and then right after that at two o'clock there'll be another panel that's for the other podcast show that i'm a part of talk more talk a solo beatles video cast the panel with us will be about the mccartney legacy book and uh Come on board, come and watch us, ask Alan all the questions you want. Um, And then the Talk More Talk panel is going to be about 1973 being the dream Beatle year, especially when you look at all the solo Beatle releases of that year and the Red and the Blue collections as well. Um, Alan, you want to talk about your 
uh, appearances? Because you're going to be interviewed quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm on an uh, Meet the Authors panel Friday at like 5.15. Um, and at, I think, 8.30, I'm doing an interview with Wally Pedrazic. Mm -hmm. Then Saturday at 1 is hours. And um, I, I can't remember what time uh doing another interview saturday with al sussman and former things we said today co-host mm -hmm. um and then um sunday i'm doing an interview with ken dashow on the main stage of this thing um and then in between they've got me um signing books actually the books they have are already signed by both me and adrian um, but I can personalize them, you know, uh, while I'm there, uh, but, because Adrian isn't coming. So, um, otherwise, uh, otherwise it would be just me and that'd be only half of the authors of this book. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, they've got, they've got a, a, quite a bunch that are, that we signed in December for them. Um, we took a few hours and sat at a table and signed books. Uh, so I, each day there is like a, you know, hour and a half session where I'll be sitting at a table with a, a fest for Beatle fans person. Um, they'll be selling them. I'll be signing them. And and that's that. So I'll be there the whole weekend. Um, I'll be easy to find if you want to come up and say hi. OK. Do you want to talk about your schedule, Darren? Sure. But as for me at the fest. Uh, I don't have the exact, I'm confused. I'm going to have to make a list for myself. I probably will be around the main ballroom for a time Friday evening, maybe doing some of the introduce, some of the bands that are playing, introduce them. I probably will cross paths with Tom Frangione on the main stage on Friday. I think that's it. I think it's pretty casual. I'll probably be hanging out at the hotel bar watching the Mets uh, Friday night. Um Saturday, uh, we have our panel, Things We Said Today, at 1. Mm -hmm. And later in the day, I'm not sure if I have anything else later in the day. Sunday's the heavy day for me. Um, I will be on a media panel. Um, I'm going to be uh, uh, moderating, uh, collecting the Beatles panel, which I believe Joe Mayo is one of the people on the panel. Mm -hmm. and possibly Tom Hunyadi uh, and some other, me. some other folks. Probably uh, Kiddo Tool, someone like that. I am, not sure. And in between um, the um, moderating, the collecting panel and the being on the media panel, I'm going to be uh, interviewing Patty Harrison, Patty Boyd, on the main stage on Sunday. So um, she's one of the uh, big guests this weekend. So, you know, like like uh, like Alan, I'll be around the whole time. And Ken, you're there just on Saturday. Only on Saturday. Yeah. yeah so. We should just say um, you can always just go to the website, thefest.com, and they have their schedule posted there. Um, and on Saturday, like I said, we have the two panels, things we said today at one o'clock, talk more talk at two o'clock okay. in the tell me what you see room. I'm also going to be interviewing Jay Bergen, who was John Lennon's defense attorney in the Morris Levy, Chuck Berry, you can't catch me come together case. Um, I hope he's not tired of me because this will be the fourth time I've interviewed him. We interviewed him here. I had him on my YouTube channel, actually at the Chicago Fest. He was there, and I interviewed him from this room on Zoom. Now, Jay actually had um, a burst appendix in January, and he's been recovering, and he's at his home in South Carolina. So now I'm going to be at the fest interviewing him on Zoom. <laughs> and they haven't determined what room that's going to be in, but it will be at uh, 450 on saturday and then at 5 30 back to the tell me what you see room and i'll be interviewing madeline baccaro who you've seen here on this channel on my channel on talk more talk on two legs she is the wonderful author of the new book on yoko ono and uh just the whole discussion about yoko and 
her importance to John, their relationship. And so I'll be involved with four things. The uh, things we said today, Talk More Talk, Jay Bergen interview, Madeline Baccaro interview. And that's all on Saturday. So if you can, stop by and say hello to me. Say hi to all of us. I'll probably um, uh, be sitting in listening to the Jay Bergen and Madeline Baccaro interviews. Okay. So I'll, I, you know, I'll make noises in the background too. So you'll hear that I'm there. <laughs> And and that's supposed to be on Zoom, and um, there's a virtual ticket that you can purchase for the fest if you can't make it there, and that's supposed to be available on Zoom that way, that you can watch it as it's happening. Now, if you happen to be watching this or listening to us or watching this show on um, the Monday after the fest, everything we just went through doesn't matter because you'll have missed everything. We should have told them to fast forward at the beginning. <laughs> so for those of you watching this this week and this weekend, there you go. Okay. And for those watching after the weekend, you missed. Well, let's get to our main topic of conversation, and that is the 60th anniversary of the Beatles' first album in the UK. Please please me. Um, 14 songs in total, eight of them original, six covers. Uh, before the album came out, the Beatles had already released two singles, Love Me Do, backed with P.S. I Love You, also Please Please Me and Ask Me Why, four of the 14 songs that were on the album. And on that very big day in Beatle history, February 11th of 1963, they went to EMI Studios and they recorded the remaining 10 songs all in one day quite a feat right there and some things that i'm sure you've all heard about originally george martin wanted the beatles first album to be a live album at the cavern but he discovered that the acoustics weren't really good for that and also to move all of emi's recording equipment into the cavern was not something that that was possible so they decided to record it in the studio quite a miraculous feat to do the 10 songs during that one day and uh we're here to talk about all that music but um before we do that i was just thinking that for all of us we were introduced to this music through the american albums whether it was um the early beatles on capital or introducing the beatles on vj and then you know i was aware later on that the albums were different in the uk and i bought some of their albums on vinyl as imports but it wasn't really until the cds came out for me in 1987 when i just started to listen to all their albums as they came out in the uk i was used to the american ones but i switched completely once the cds came out but i'm wondering you know for people like us who were brought up on the american albums was it kind of anticlimactic or less exciting for us to discover the early stuff, the way that it came out when we knew all the songs anyway. Yeah. But also introducing the Beatles was so similar in a way it had just about the same selection, though there were two versions that came out of introducing the Beatles. The first one with love me do and PS I love you and please, please me and ask why was the second version, but it was basically the same album. Mm -hmm. But um, how do you relate to all this considering the fact that, you know, we were brought up on the American albums first. Alan? I started getting into the British albums when I was in college. Actually, I mean, I, I, I was aware of them because um, my pals and I used to go down, you know, into Manhattan record shopping in, in the village and there were import shops. And we used to sort of flip through the British import Beatles section and say, what's this? You know, um, so I sort of, you know, had had hankered after them when I was in high school and younger. Um, but then when I got to college and had some actual money of my own and a uh, job at a record store, um, mm -hmm. we just sort of, you know, would order them for our import section. And, you know, I bought them all there. So by the time I got out of college, I had the whole British set. Um, and from about that point on until about 2004, when the first Capital box uh, of CDs came out, I pretty much listened exclusively to the British albums. Um, so 
I, I'm not sure I found it disorienting or I, I, I just found it, um, you know, interesting that, okay, this is the album they made and therefore this is the album I want to hear. Um, and really pretty much on one hand, put the American albums out of my mind, but on the other hand, you know, uh, I'll still hear, you know, uh, 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 you know, Dr. Robert and think what well, yesterday should follow or something, you know, whatever mm. is on the American album I actually grew up with and, you know, played to death. I mean, the, the, the grooves are still sort of in there, you know, uh, um, but um, yeah, you know, for, for this album, apart from uh, introducing the Beatles, we had the early Beatles, but the early Beatles had only what, like 10 of the tracks or something like that. It was, it was 11. Yeah, it. it was it was shorter. Um, uh, yeah, you know, so I mean, so to me, this is like, OK, this is their first album. This is what they intended us to hear. Um, it's hard not to think of I saw her standing there belonging on Meet the Beatles with I Want to Hold Your Hand. Um, you know, even when I listen to this today that track sounds to me more modern than everything else on the album. And oh. so it sounds as if it belongs on the next album, which the whole album sounded a bit more modern than this one did. You know, you could, you could, you can see the sort of technology itself and their use of technology sort of increasing album by album. And, and so I saw her standing there, sounds to me like it belongs to the others although there's no reason it should you know i mean it's just the group pretty much live except for some hand claps and uh you know just like everything else on this album so you know that's that's obviously conditioning from listening to meet the beatles so many times as a kid N mm -hmm. not to mention i want to hold your hand and i saw her standing there as the single that they didn't make <laughs> you know but that capital made for them Mm. Um, uh, it was great pairing i thought but nevertheless uh but but yeah i mean it, i i didn't have any trouble getting used to this once i saw, saw what it was just because i thought of it as okay this is this is what this is the album they made this is the album they put out this, this is what they intended everyone to hear this is what their original audiences in england heard and uh so i was sort of all in yeah, I was, I'm pretty much the same way. It didn't take me long to adapt to all the British albums mm. once they came out on CD. But I will always have an affection for the American ones, too. And like you said, Alan, there are times when you hear a certain song and you think about the next song that followed on the American album, you just hear it in your head. Mm -hmm. It's so burned into your brain so much. Yeah. yeah. And Darren, I how do you still think Rubber Soul should start with, well, I've just seen a face. I mean, it's, you know, it's just... <laughs> A much better start of an album a lot of people feel the same way mm -hmm. yeah. yeah how about you darren um all of this passed me by because i'm the youngest of the three of us um um i don't i don't remember when it became apparent to me that the records were different in the uk as opposed to the us it's possible it was that giveaway sheet that was packaged with the uh, the Red and Blue albums in 73. You know, there was that. Mm. And yeah. I remember I studied that when when I got I, I got the Blue album first and I got the Red album on cassette. So I studied that insert in the Blue album. So I probably that was probably when I discovered that. And I don't, I don't have it handy, but I'm assuming the UK album discography was printed on that with the titles that I wouldn't have been familiar with. Please, please me with the Beatles, Beatles for sale. That's it. Maybe a collection of Beatles oldies might have been on that list. As far as I remember, I was, I was kind of aware that there was a difference uh, between the two countries when it came to the albums. And I remember hearing in the 70s, maybe it was on some radio stations, sometimes we'd talk about that and would do a, an A and B. 
Mm -hmm. I remember hearing on the radio back a long time ago having the U.S. mix of She's a Woman played next to the uh, the actual, the, the real mix that was on the U.K. Uh, release uh, and comparing and how those mixes can be very different. I think that's one of the best examples of uh, the U.S. versus the U.K. Um, for me, ultimately, though, I lived in the U.S. I was... Uh, uh, an American and American albums are what I lived and died by. I don't remember having any desire to go out and find the British albums on LP. Um, I was kind of a stickler. I was beginning to, my, my me collecting albums and records was starting to form. And that was sort of one of the guidelines that I wanted the American records. Um I was younger and money wasn't plentiful. So it was usually, you know, if I had a little a job or something or got a handout from, from, from grandma or something like that, it was like one record or maybe two records I could go buy. I wasn't mm. going to buy something that was kind of redundant. So for me, the real listening experience was when the CDs came out in 87 uh, into 88 i think they were like released in stages the first cd i bought was revolver um because i just thought that it's possible sergeant pepper hadn't been released yet when i got my first cd player um and i didn't um i didn't really own all the cds until um maybe the early 90s when they put out the uh, parlophone put out that a uh, box set that had that sliding wood, that wooden box set that had that sliding drawer okay. and revealed all of the CDs in there in chronological order. And I got that and that gave me boom in one shot. I had everything UK. And from that point on the U S album stayed in the stayed on the racks uh, because I realized that the quality was better. The mixes were real um cds were more convenient than going digging through my albums and i was you know went on over to the to the to the vinyl uh to me not the vinyl i'm sorry i went on over to the uk uh so please please me as an album i don't remember it having really any impact because to me it was just throwing the early Beatles on or, or something else. Uh, mm -hmm. But I know what Alan means about, I saw her standing there, standing out and jumping out on that album. Uh, it, it, it's interesting uh, because it's, 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 it's glaring. Uh, it just seems like a tighter, hotter band uh, that has already matured a little beyond what the rest of the record sounds like. Um Looking back at it now, you uh, you, you listen to it and, you, you know, some of the songs don't hold up as well. You realize how they were blossoming as songwriters. Love Me Do, a good example of a very simple song with really not much to it. But I think what was the, um, the real eye-catching thing, it, I'm assuming, again, I wasn't born yet when it came out, was multiple lead singers multiple songwriters and the fact that more than half of the album was original material, which I've never really gone digging around to see what else was coming out mm -hmm. in 63, but I think it's a fairly safe assumption. It was fairly unusual for a pop band, especially a debuting band to have more than half of their tracks uh, as original songs. By the way, look at the way the credits are. McCartney Lennon. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, so um, but for per personal impact, it didn't have one for me. Again, because I was playing catch up and really didn't uh put Beatles for sale or please please me on in my in my apartment until uh maybe the tail end of the eighties, early nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that point I was well aware the mixes are gonna be different. The configurations are, are different. 
Um, it's going to be a little bit of a different listening experience, but nothing earth shattering, nothing that I wasn't prepared for by that time. Hmm. You don't find it fascinating because I do with every Beatles album to think that this was their start, knowing that they were going to album to album progress, you know, to think that this is what they unleashed on the world. Their very first album. I think it's extremely impressive for reasons like you just mentioned. Eight of the 14 songs are original. Yeah. And it is it is amazing to think, and it's something that I think we all take for granted, that all four Beatles do a lead vocal here. I mean, Ringo gets sure, one, yeah, right. but yeah. he gets one. Yeah. Every member of the group does a lead vocal, and it also became like a template for what was to follow, because... They always tried to make sure that George had a couple of songs and they always tried to make sure that Ringo had one song. Although there's a few Beatles albums where Ringo didn't. But for the most part, it was John and Paul dominating with lead vocals, George getting a couple of songs and Ringo getting one. And that started with the very first album. So you knew that was that was intentional when they made the album. That was making else. a statement, you know? Yeah. Something else, um, I think the album was uh, shows... Uh some good variety in the material that they were writing and choosing to cover. Again, I don't pretend to be an expert in, with the pop scene in 63 and how many um, artists and, and, and a number of the, and the artists that were coming out at that time, what records they were putting out. But I would assume that a lot of the full length albums from, from the popular artists of the time tended to all be, tended to all contain material that was similar. I'm just going to make a generalization there, and hopefully uh, you folks agree with me. But Please Please Me did show a, a, a variety and showed that the Beatles had the skills to go from A Taste of Honey to I Saw Her Standing There. Their drummer could sing Boys... And then you'd have Twist and Shout with Lennon belting out the vocal. And then something even sweeter like, um, oh, I don't know, um, Baby It's You or, you know, a mellow or softer song. Mm -hmm. I always get a kick out of the fact that George really does not. They were two of them were sick. I know George was sick when they recorded uh, Please Please Me. No, I didn't hear that. John John had a cold. You might be thinking of when he came to to do the Sullivan show. George was sick. Maybe that's what you're. Thinking. I could be because I always hear George the way he sings. Do you want to know a secret? And it almost can hear like he's well. But uh, I could be again. You guys say I'm wrong. I could be. You know, yeah, George George did say he wasn't happy with his vocal on that song. Yeah. But, but uh, no, John John definitely had a cold when he was sucking lozenges throughout the session on February 11th. So, and that's another thing. When you take a look at how they recorded that day on February 11th, they had three sessions and they kind of paced everything so that even though John did backup vocals, harmony vocals, when it came to lead vocals, they saved Baby It's You and twist and shout as the last songs kind of i guess to rest john a bit mm -hmm. you know it's very interesting when you take a look at how they how they recorded in their three sessions that day um in case you don't know i thought i'd bring it up here the first session um they recorded there's a place and what was then called 17 i saw her standing there just two songs and then the next session, the, the first session um, was at 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Then the next session was at 2.30. They recorded A Taste of Honey, then Do You Want to Know a Secret, then Misery. And then the last session from 7.30 uh, to uh, 1 in the morning. They started with Hold Me Tight. They attempted Hold Me Tight and didn't work out. And that session tape doesn't exist anymore for that. But then they recorded for the next album. So then they did Anna, uh, Boys, Chains, Baby It's You, and Twist and Shout. 
So it really helped that you had four lead vocalists there to spread things out over that time. And um, you were mentioning the variety, Darren, and that's certainly true. That's one of the things that Brian Epstein thought was was uh, a real plus, that an advantage in the Beatles was that they recorded so many different styles and could appeal mm -hmm. to different audiences. And um, you mentioned A Taste of Honey. I always equate A Taste of Honey with Till There Was You on the next album. And like you think about the first appearance on the Ed Sullivan show, they did Till There Was You. That could attract a very different audience yeah. and the people who are who are waiting to hear I Want to Hold Your Hand. You know? So all that, again, was planned. I think it's very clever what they did for this for this first album. Yeah, so 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 the the, the songwriting might have still been a little bit uh, uh in a little bit of a raw state, you know, because you know, it's, like I said before, like something like "Love Me Do" is incredibly simple, but they were they were already maturing before our eyes right there because elsewhere on the album there are uh, some more sophisticated tunes, um, and. Um, um ask me why is one of them and you mentioned um uh you mentioned it before i'm looking at the wrong yes i love you uh uh no baby it's you no that wasn't theirs no uh that was one of the covers um it wasn't misery all, it wasn't all simplistic i think is my point mm -hmm. you know it was there was definitely already growth to be heard now looking back at it mm. you hear that uh the songwriting, some songs that maybe might have been older tunes, some songs that might have been newer tunes. And again, the variety uh, and all the different vocalists uh, had to make that album stand apart from the other albums of the day in the UK in 63. Um, and this is still at a point when the single took priority. Right. So... You know, the Beatles gave you, please, please me, uh, bang for your buck in giving you like a complete varied album listening experience. Whereas I think a lot of other artists, um, their records were probably rather, how would you say, you know, not bland. That's that's not fair, but one dimensional. Hmm. Um the one thing that always annoyed me a little bit about the first Beatles album is the title, which they probably didn't give. It was probably the record company suggesting to call the album Please Please Me with Love Me Do and 12 other songs. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it needs a little more of a substantial title there. But other than that, um, I have a question, actually, for Alan and or you, Ken. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking... During the Beatles' history in the 60s, they tended, more times than not, to keep the singles separate from the albums. And that tended to be, generally speaking, how things were done in the UK, at least when it came to the Beatles. Maybe less so in the US. But yet, the two current singles that the Beatles had released in the UK, Parlophone made sure that the four songs from those singles would be on the album. Because that's um, what's selling the album, you know, for their, their, their first album that from Parlophone's point of view would have been the reason people would buy the album would be to get those, those singles um, as well. You know, if they didn't already have them, that was the selling point. Um, but I mean, what, what British people tell me is that it was not unusual to think of singles and albums separately for bands there. It was kind of unusual here, here, the idea that the single is what sells the album goes way back. Um, but, but for the Beatles and, and other British groups, the single was a separate thing. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, the fact that they, even named it as you say, please please me with love me do in twelve um kind of indicates that you know what they expect is gonna sell this record or those those songs that everybody knows already. Mm. Um I think yeah. you know in terms of the variety on this album, it, it 
probably has to do with the fact that, um, as you know, John has said, and you know, I think we just know is basically the case that is that this was more or less a stage set for them, you know, um, and you you can see how it's arranged. I mean, starting with I saw her standing there and ending with twist and shout, it gives you a lot of energy at the start and the end. And then in the middle, it goes on all these little byways, you know, misery, Anna, chains, boys, you know, it, it, the, the, the temperature goes up and down, you know, if, if you think of, of it being rocky as hotter, and ballady is cooler, uh, you know, it, 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 it changes a lot. Um, but also as, as, uh, I can't remember which of you said it, but uh, I think Darren, uh, about you can, you can already see the, the compositional progression, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, love me do really is about as simple as you can get. And just from there to please, please me is a huge leap. Yeah. Please Please Me is brilliant. I mean, I listened to this album twice today. I mean, it's only like 25 minutes or so, um, you know, so, uh, you know, and, and and just every time Please Please Me came on, it was just like, yeah, wow, yeah, what a song, you know, what a sound, you know. Um, but then even with Love Me Do, too, you know, you, you could say what a sound in a way. I mean, it's very simple, but um, those those sort of, the, the harmonies that they're doing is was what at the time was thought of as a very beatly harmony you know it's um you know we were just getting the the tolly single version and uh you know and and the vj album but you know that harmony was was sort of unusual to us in america because it's it's almost a little medieval you know a mm -hmm. little medieval english medieval english folk you know uh interesting you no know, and it and it just was a little bit exotic you know oh, we should have we should have had, had someone you know someone my age and british on here with us to sort of give us the perspective of of what all that was to them at the time you know mm. but um but yeah, you know, I mean, the 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 variety, I think, has to do with the fact that uh, the, their stage set had that kind of variety, too. And whether that was their own instinct or Brian's advice or whatever it was, it's, uh, you know, it's 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 kind of clear. And this album and the next album were both more or less idealized versions of their of what they were playing in concert. So, um you know they would they would have that kind of variety for a live show too yeah if you take a look at all the the research that mark lewison has done on what the beatles used to perform live in their early years leading up to this there was so much variety there yeah you know but um brian certainly recognized that he could use that to to the beatles advantage but certainly when you're talking about progress and the songwriting, even this early on, I really look at Ask Me Why, which a lot of people just dismiss <laughs> um, as being some simple song. It was a little bit more complicated than that. It had a Latin vibe to it, yeah. as did P.S. I Love You, which I think was very unique for those two songs. And, um, you know, Ask Me Why has that other section in there, the I Can't Believe It's Happening to Me, putting more effort into just a, a really in just two minutes what two minutes four seconds whatever it is they pack a lot of work into the the songwriting of that yeah. of uh, that particular tune and we have talked about it's been a while though but there's a place is definitely you know you you can say i know paul said it was um a more cerebral kind of a song because it was talking about going into the mind and perhaps that was um, a forerunner of Strawberry Fields Forever or a song like that, that early on. What it really was a forerunner of, I don't know if it was actually a forerunner. I know what you're going to say, because you said it before. <laughs> the other one might have come first. I can't, can never remember which came first. And and I think it's pretty clear that neither group heard the other, but the yeah. boys in my room right. even begins, you know, there's a place where I can go. Right. 
You know, I mean, they're both in a way the same idea. So I, I think what we're talking about is these two groups completely sort of capturing the zeitgeist, you know, for, um, you know, what young people were thinking and feeling at the time of, you know, the idea of, you know, needing a, a place to go and, and be away from it all and, uh, and, and, and get into your own mind, you know, and, 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 um, I, I've always been fascinated by the similarity of those two songs and, and, you know, pretty sure that neither, neither group would have heard the other. It's just, you know, it's just the time. It's what it was. Mm. It's also interesting, you know, you hear so much, especially with John always talking about, you know, fifties rock and roll and how much, well, all of them loved fifties rock. And yet please, please me was partly um influenced by a bing crosby song <laughs> called please because john loved the double use of the word please in there please lend your little ears to my please yeah. he liked that yeah. so and also do you want to know a secret um was influenced by a song wishing well wishing well yeah from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So, you know, the Beatles' influences, as we eventually are, were to learn, can go all over the place. And a lot of it could easily be from pre-rock and roll. Oh, yeah. Well, Paul talked about that a lot, you know, later, a bit later in his life, um, that, you know, he, yeah, he he loved rock and roll, but he also grew up listening to the stuff that his father listened to. Yep. And that's why he was the one to sing, uh, you know, Taste of Honey and um, Till There Was You. Right. And that's why, you know, one of his very earliest compositions is Suicide. Um, and Suicide is totally in that vein. Um you know, and it's it's kind of funny. I mean, just as an aside here, um, mm. how frequently in the uh, you know unreleased McCartney canon, how frequently suicide comes up. You know, he he recorded a version of it when he was working on the McCartney album. He um, I think they did it. Uh, he he must have run through it a couple of times during the get back, let it be sessions. Um, if he mm. did, uh, that, that would surprise me. Um, he did it during uh, one hand clapping He right. did it during the Elstree sessions um, for, you know, before the 1975, 76 world tour. You know, it's a song that it, in a way it's not even really finished. It's really only a, a, a verse or two. Um, but he is constantly playing that thing. It's on the uh, the piano tape too, which is uh, his composing tape while he was writing uh, the stuff for Venus and Mars. It's just, it's almost every, I'm beginning to find that almost any time he's got a tape recorder on, he plays Suicide. Um, <laughs> and Suicide is a totally previous era kind of song. He intended, he, he, he envisioned it as being for Frank Sinatra, you know, um, so yeah, you know, we think because we're a bit younger than they are, um, that, you know, yeah, there were the Beatles rock and roll, you mm. know, and we grew up with rock and roll and we, you know, maybe belatedly we came to the stuff that our parents listened to. And I, right. in my case, really belatedly, um, uh, apart from the classical stuff, but, uh, for them, it was part of their world. You know, it, it, they 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 probably made a distinction of, you know, the different kinds of music, but they loved all different kinds of things. And you hear that a bit on Please Please Me and also with the Beatles, um, you know, just look, you look, ask me why as well. It's their own song. But to me, it sounds like that is a song that someone could have written, recorded it a little differently and their parents could have liked it. You know, it was a very standard kind of pre-rock and roll pop song mm -hmm. with that Latin beat and everything, mm -hmm. you know, and this is why, I mean, I don't know if we want to get into this, but you and I can have had this conversation about whether this album sounds dated or not, you know, and whether that even matters. But, um, but to me, 
Ask Me Why sounds like exactly the kind of song that the Beatles swept away with I Saw Her Standing There and everything else that they did, you know. And yet they did, you know, Honey Pie, <laughs> you know. That's right. When I'm, when 64. I'm 64. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, it's very, it's just the thing about the Beatles. It's, it's very impossible. It's very difficult to sort of paint with a completely broad brush and say, this is what they did. This right. is what they were. Because they were everything. They were the zenith of Western Civ, like I say. <laughs> that's that's really a very interesting observation, though, about Ask Me Why, that it could have been an older song. You know, you can also apply that with P.S. I Love You. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Only you speed it up a little bit, you rock it up a little, just a little, and it has a more modern rock sound to it. Yeah. So, very interesting. Whereas, How about the okay. there's a place in misery, and do you want to know a secret? You wouldn't think of as as potentially previous generation kind of songs. It, it just doesn't have. It has much. It, they all have more of a rock and roll sound, or rock and roll in the sense of you know vocal group rock and roll rather than Chuck Berry rock and roll. If you know what I mean, right? And, and also. Uh, we all know this. It's part of Beatles folklore, but Please Please Me originally was a slower song mm-hmm. in the style of Roy Orbison. Mm-hmm. So you could hear melodically what it would have sounded like slowed down with powerful vocals like Roy's had. So that's how John envisioned it in the very beginning. So, but George Martin suggested to speed it up. And it became their first number one. Yeah. Because John wanted to be in the traveling Wilburys before George. <laughs> <laughs> um, I while you guys were talking, uh, I, it occurred to me that some of the songs, definitely one of the songs, I was familiar with from uh, before I ever knew that the Beatles recorded. And that, and the one song that's a definite is "A Taste of Honey," which I knew from Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but let's see, "A Taste of Honey" would have been that was on the early Beatles, right? Yes. So, all right, so that would have been my introduction to that song by the Beatles. Would be the early Beatles, which I had on cassette. And that was like, wait a minute, that's the same song that is on one of Dad's albums, Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was also familiar with some of the names in the songwriter, uh, you know, credits. Uh-huh. Um, so I was sort of kind of aware that who these people were. Uh, maybe I thought it was a little interesting that the Beatles were recording these songs or recording these songwriters. But um, again, all of this while I'm listening to you guys is all learning what co- completely was behind me because mm. I, you know I wasn't I wasn't born yet. And I don't mean to keep bringing that up, but um, you know, really, the early Beatles was was the introduction to the majority of these songs. Sure, for you, for me, and uh, having the cassette. Uh, uh, and, and it's funny, I've looked this up online and I drove this out there to see if anyone else uh, maybe could um, could uh, shine a little light on this. I had it on cassette and um, I don't know if it was a manufacturing issue that went um, that was the case with many of the tapes or I just had a bum copy, but the pitch on i think it was halfway through one of the sides side one or side two uh changed on a few of the songs where everything started playing slower <laughs> and in fact um ps i love you was one of the songs that was playing at that was on the tape at the wrong speed and it was very bizarre because you had listened to one whole side and then you get another halfway through another side. And then all of a sudden 
every song sounds as though someone's been lean, was leaning on the turntable, slowing it down. And mm -hmm. I sent it back to Capitol because it said in the cassettes, any any defects, mail it back for a replacement. The replacement was it the same tape? I don't know, but the replacement had the same fault. Hmm. Uh, and I've done some digging around online to see if maybe that was a, um, you know, a fault with a, a pressing plant or something. Um, and I still hear uh, PSI Love You in my head at the wrong speed when I hear it a plane being played on the radio. Uh, all of this has nothing to do really with Please Please Me, the album as a whole. But again, these are little bits of my exposure to these songs as I grew up through the years, having have experienced this stuff when it was brand brand new. There probably was a bad batch along the way. Yeah, but it was weird because I, I often wondered if they just threw the same cassette back in a in whatever envelope or in the box and sent it back to me come straight um, back. because it was the, the same defect. And I had also, and this is getting way off topic, I don't mean to do that, at the same time, got the Red Album on cassette. Uh, and the Red Album, the tape ran out before the songs were done on side A. Hmm. I'd never experienced anything like that before or after, but there was still an entire song to go through in midway. I, I'm not going to pull up the, uh, the track running order on the Red Album, but with a song and a half to go, the tape runs out and side one ended. And you flipped it over to play side two of the cassette. And the beginning of Help with the big James Bond introduction uh -huh. is sort of garbled and faded in like the tape wasn't. Uh, something was definitely wrong there. So did you buy it from this guy on the street corner? <laughs> <laughs> it was probably Corvettes. That was that was the place. And, you know, my folks tended probably at that point to get me a lot of my music as gifts and whatnot. So probably a Corvettes or Record World or Sam Goody thing. But uh, question for you two youngsters, <laughs> since you um, both came to this album through the CD. Um, how did you feel about the CD coming out only in mono? Didn't bother you. But I didn't I mean, think like, about I it that much. Just, I mean, what was it uh, up until what was the first stereo CD? The first album that the George Martin uh, mastered for CD Help. and stereo. Help. Help. I just looked at it. I just looked at it like George Martin knows what he's doing. I trusted, you know, that decision. And those early records, I know, I, I knew at the time I was aware of the fact that the early records, mono was the primary um, means of listening uh, to these songs. So I had no issue with it. Um, I had an issue with it. because I bet you would have. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I had an issue with it and I made a big deal of it. <laughs> you know, it's funny though, but that's a good example about how the music industry has treated the compact disc and mm. treated reissuing music that today you could get an album uh, that will be sold to you in a box set or something with the mono mix, the stereo mix, the new remix, the unreleased mix, the mix they thought they didn't record, but they did. Well, here it is for the first time. Um, as opposed to 1987 when, all right, Please Please Me was meant to be listened to in mono. Therefore, even though this is digital reproduction, we're going to reproduce it on CD in mono. Yeah, but that's not why Period. they did it that way. That's only why they said they did it that way. Oh, um, they had an ulterior mode. They knew they were putting out box sets in 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay. You know, I came to it from an American perspective. And so we grew up and, you know, okay, when I was very young, my first records were mono because that's what I had. But, you know, older people had stereos, like, you know, people like parents and stuff. Um, and 
as soon as I could get a stereo, I, you know, I did. And I went out and got all the records again in stereo. And so, yeah. Tama, I want to jump in right there where you're talking. At that, when you were younger, buying music at that, whatever year you're, or years you're talking about, did you, as a consumer, can, uh, consciously go in there looking to buy the mono album or as opposed to the stereo pressing? Um, yeah, but partly because I had a mono record player and they were a dollar cheaper and I was on an allowance. <laughs> and how about like your friends and general public? Were people, was that important, an important buying point? I'm here to buy the new blank album and I need it in stereo because I just have a new stereo. We don't have it, sir, in stereo. Okay, I'll come back. Well, or did you accept the mono and... I don't know when I was that age, but by the time it got to be, um, well, <clears throat> the White Album was the first one in the U.S. that came out only in stereo. Magical Mystery Tour came out in mono and stereo, but the monos were really hard to find. And I was still buying mono records in those days. Um, so I actually found a mono Magical Mystery Tour when it came out. Um, but you know, I, so I don't know what, what people slot people a bit older than me who had stereos probably bought the stereo versions because they were equipped to play it. You know, in those days you couldn't, you, if you, if you played a stereo record on a mono player, first of all, the impression you'd had was that you were going to ruin the record and also it wouldn't sound right. Um, so, but then, you know, I mean, by the time I was, um, you know, maybe 15 and, and had my first stereo, I went and got all of them in stereo again. And I know that among American collectors, having all the Beatles stuff in stereo is a big thing because, you know, we used to keep tabs on what became a, the relatively few tracks that were only available in mono. And that was the inner light. Um, I'll get you. She loves you. Um, you know, and I'm down. I think there were only four of them. You know, and I remember when CD was about to come out. Yeah, you know, by okay, <laughs> by that point we had, you know, we were all getting them in stereo, but we then discovered that the mono mixes were different. So we went back and got the mono ones again that we had gotten rid of when we got our stereo ones, so that we could have both. And I remember the big worry in 1987 or 86 when it was announced that they'd be coming out in 87 was that they were only going to put out the stereo and the mono would be lost. And we wanted them both. Then when they put out only the mono, it seemed really, really eccentric. Um, and so I was reviewing the first four for the times and I thought, I thought, you know, I, I don't really understand this because CD can hold 80 minutes, maybe at the time they were saying 75. Um, but these albums are so short, you could put them in mono and stereo plus the related singles, you know. So I started, you know, writing something to that effect and then got an interview with George Martin. And what George Martin told me was that, Jeff Emmerich, oh, they they hadn't even brought George Martin in on the on the CD reissues originally. They gave it to Jeff Emmerich to do, and Jeff Emmerich made stereo transfers, and they played them for George Martin. And the way George Martin put it was, they played it for me so that I could say, and and said, you know, didn't we do a wonderful job? And I and I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> um, he said. These first few should be in mono. And if you're going to do them in stereo, they really need to be remixed because the first album in particular and most of the second album were recorded on two track. And basically what came out in stereo was um, more or less unmixed two tracks. You know, there was a little bit of, of blending, but, um, you know, instruments on one side, vocals on the other. And, to George Martin, no, this is the raw tape. This is the raw unmixed tape. You want to do some mixing. You want to do something. Um, and that's what he would have done. But EMI said to him, well, we don't have time for that. 
And why don't we have time for that? Because we want to have Sergeant Pepper come out on June 1st so that we can say it was 20 years ago today because 1987, 1967. So entirely because their ad campaign was built around saying it was 20 years ago today, they said, we don't have time for you to remix in stereo. We're putting out the first four only in mono. And he he was okay about it being in mono because, as you say, mono was the primary listening experience for most people, at least in Britain. Um, but they were also claiming that the stereo ones never came out, but they did. I mean, this isn't a first pressing, but as you can see, there's a, a stereo number, PCS. Does that show? Yeah. Um, and I found a... Beatles program book from 1963 from right before th with the Beatles came out. It wasn't out yet. They were going out on tour and it said, you know, soon to be released or gave the release date, whatever. And it showed the covers of both Please Please Me and with the Beatles and gave both the mono and stereo catalog numbers proving that they came out in mono and stereo in Britain. When I talked to George Martin about that, he he said, no, but you know, they didn't come out in stereo. And I said, yes, they they did. I mean, here are these ads that give the numbers. And he said, well, you have an advantage of me on me because um at the time I was so busy, I didn't even have time for lunch, let alone knowing what they were putting out in mono and stereo. Um, I found that a little hard to believe. He's the producer of the record. He has to know what formats they're putting it out. He must have just forgot. But um, in any case, it, this became sort of a, a, a big deal at the time. It was, uh, you know, CD gate. <laughs> so um, it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun getting um, EMI all irritated about it because it also it also basically called the lie on what they were doing in terms of, you know, going out there claiming that these were only ever released in mono because they weren't only ever released in mono. You you can say, you can make the argument that they're better in mono, mm -hmm. that most people heard them in mono, that the Beatles preferred them in mono, all that. But you can't say that they weren't released in stereo. And I like the stereo ones. I like them both, you know, but... um you know, I always liked it having instruments on one side and vocals on the other because, you know, as a little kid with a band, you could turn down the vocals and hear what's going on in the instrumental section. And, and you can you can learn the parts a bit more easily if you're not distracted by those nuisance vocals. Or if you want to learn the vocals, <laughs> you can learn, you know, all the nuances without being distracted by those nuisance instruments. Hmm. Um, and when I, you know, was a you know, little kid in my room recording multi-track demos, that's how I mixed all my stuff. I had all the vocals on one side and the instruments on the other, because to me, that was George Martin did it that way. You know, that was how you do it. <laughs> I'm picturing uh, little Alan Cozen with a four track mixer and me with my mono Zenith tape recorder playing drums on two phone books and making my own homemade uh, uh, tapes. Um, you had a four track. How, how young were you when you had the four track? I didn't have, I had two track, but, oh, oh, oh. Um, but I had two of them. So what I would do is I'd, I'd record two tracks. I put it on the second machine, copy them through a mixer on onto one track of the first machine, then add another track, then copy them. <laughs> So, and how old are you at this time? About uh, 14, 15. Uh, okay. All right. Um, you know, and, and those things ended up as, you know, one big, hissy, weird stereo mix. But, you know, it, it fortunately, um, I had saved all the raw tapes before mixing them. So when digital came out, I was able to transfer all the stuff to my computer and make actual mixes <laughs> um, without any generation loss, any of the generation loss that, that I was dealing with at the time I was making them. 
um, and also ended up hearing parts that were completely buried, but were much more interesting than what you could actually hear in the finished mixes. It's a lot of fun. That's interesting that you had the mind to do that yeah. at a young age. I mean, that's what the Beatles did in the studio. To make they had to create tracks. Yeah, but it wasn't my more. idea. It was their idea. You know, <laughs> I was following everything they were doing and and thinking, okay, this is you know, I don't I don't have EMI's equipment, but I can do it with two tape recorders. You know, mm. I mean, I was just obsessed with what they did, and and um, and that's why I was doing it wasn't writing stuff quite as good as they were. <laughs> what did you do? I was in well, Yonkers. I had a, a different opinion than you, Alan, because I always find it irritating to hear lead vocals in one channel mm. and instruments on the other, especially if you're listening to the entire album and every track is that way. <laughs> and listening in your headphones on, it could be, well, for me, it can be annoying, but I was never all that affected by the whole mono issue at the time because I wasn't really studying the differences between the mono and the stereo. I was just happy that it came out on CD, period, at the time. Later on, I would study the differences. Mm -hmm. but, and, there's, um, and there's one major one on Please Please Me, which on, on the on the title track itself. Um, in the, the mono one, the words are all correct, and there is a vocal flub in the stereo one. Um, I can't remember what it was. It was uh, something like, I think it should be, I, like, I know you never even try, but he says, I know I never even try. Right. That's mm. just in stereo. Because mm. <laughs> it was an edit that was made in preparing the mono single, which went on the album. Um, but they didn't do that edit in stereo. So... And when I mentioned that kind of thing to to George Martin in 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 saying why I thought that both stereo and mono should be out, um, he said, you know, well, people people get really upset about you know the, this kind of thing, but you know, we weren't really thinking in those terms. And I said, well, it's not a matter of upset; it's a matter of it's different, and so we want both. And that hit a chord because he said, oh, it's like. It's like having an extra rill on the milled edge of a coin. And I thought, okay, he's obviously a coin collector. <laughs> and so he now understands what we're talking about when we want both mono and stereo, because he's a collector of something. And once you're a collector of something, you understand all collectors of everything one way or another. <laughs> I just wanted to bring up the covers that the Beatles did here because it's a mixture of hits and also obscure tunes. And I know that Paul prided himself in saying that the Beatles like to listen to B-sides to singles and then cover them. I mean, you've got obviously Baby It's You, which was a big hit for the Shirelles, but also Boys, which was one of their B-sides. That was never one of their hits. Um, Anna, Arthur Alexander mm -hmm. was not really a big hit on the pop charts. Chains actually was a, a top 20 hit by the Cookies uh, here in the States. Um, and uh, yeah, Taste of Honey. They were influenced by Lenny Welch's version of the song, but still it's, you know, it's movie music. It's a show tune. And um, well, Twist and Shout was familiar. But, I mean, it just gives you a glimpse right there of, you know, a mixture of hit material and obscure material, which makes it even more interesting, Yeah, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that um, Darren actually brought up a while back, and I think it's important to, to point out, was that in those days... Most teenagers didn't buy albums. They bought 45s because they couldn't afford albums. And the biggest selling albums, well, they weren't really selling that well. If it was a pop artist, well, you, you'd have someone like Elvis Presley or um, certainly in the States, if you take a look at the charts, like uh, Peter, Paul and Mary did very well with their first few albums, the Kingston Trio folk artists. But the charts were also dominated a lot by soundtrack music. And show music mm -hmm. and uh you know a west side story or uh the sound of music although that was 1965 when the movie came out anyway 
But those were really big sellers. A lot of Rodgers and Hammerstein music was there in the top 10 and at number one. And by the way, um, the Please Please Me album holds the record still to this day of the most consecutive weeks at number one on the UK charts for hmm. 30 weeks in a row. Really? And actually, um, Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water, held the number one position for 33 weeks, but that wasn't consecutive. But there were other albums that were number one even more than that, but those were all Rodgers and Hammerstein <laughs> <laughs> albums. But still, 30 weeks in a row, only to be dethroned by with the Beatles. <laughs> so you talk about domination of the charts, the album charts in the UK. That was pretty remarkable, but it helped to give life to the album, the album uh, format right there. And more kids were buying albums in part because the Beatles albums were so different and so solid and so fresh and uh, so strong. So yeah. the Beatles deserve a lot of credit for that. Yeah. Good point. Right there. Yeah. Any other final comments you want to make about the album, guys? I don't think so. I mean, we covered, I mean, covered a lot in analyzing an album that is 60 years old. That's which is a mind boggling mm -hmm. to think that. Let's revisit it on the 70th. Okay. Even more mind boggling. <laughs> Um, no, that's all I have to chime in. Again, like I said, I, I kind of feel bad because this is me trying to, um, you know, talk about my experiences with an album that came out before I was born, an album that I wasn't, wouldn't have been exposed to because it was out in the UK. If I was a little older, you know, introducing the Beatles, Meet the Beatles obviously would have been um my my entryway into their world but um now looking back at it you see that while the album might not have the clout today uh 60 years later simply because of what has gone down in music in general over a 60 year period of time back in the day in 63 um it had to be uh a bit of an eye opening experience compared to what other pop bands, pop artists were putting out on LP that the Beatles already kind of came to the game with this talent, mm. some of it already budding, some of it about to, you know, start to grow. Uh, they were already um, ahead of their peers. Okay. Well, we could all look at things very differently, Darren. And to me, when I hear early Beatles stuff, even though I know it was recorded at a different time, it still sounds fresh to me. So um, even not just I saw her standing there, but so much of this other stuff, which um, because there's always that evolution going, there's always this growth from one album to another. Even if you go back to the Decca uh, audition, to this you'll see a tremendous growth in the band mm -hmm. and that's part of the fascination of it all and um you know we've talked many times about music being dated and it has absolutely no effect on me whatsoever because i'm still going to love the music the same as i always have and um you don't get the impression that i don't mm -hmm. simply because it's older or sounds dated for lack of a better way of putting it it's it's the product of the age there was no other way it could sound um uh, and i don't want to give off that that opinion that i think that way um i'm trying to compare the quality the diversity of the album circa 1963 to what else was coming out at that time and i can only imagine that it was today it's 60 years old. Mm -hmm. Nothing to, you know, it's hard to compare something today to something that came out in 63. But at the that time, was it, was it a revolver of 63 when it came out? Do you know what I'm trying to get at? It was, it you know, because nobody else time. was doing yeah. this type. At least I don't think they were putting out these, these, these kinds of albums at that time. Uh, with the quality of the songs 
covers mixed with original. And we will see them there. I think you know, you know, where I'm going with that. But uh -huh. all right, I get your point. Anything you want to add to that, Alan? I don't think so. Um, you know, we've 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 had the debate about um, uh, dated or not dated, and and like Darren, I, I I'm not using that as a, a value judgment about whether it's an album I want to hear, you know, I mean, I'm, I am I think of Please Please Me as sounding a little dated these days. Um, and yet, you know, you put it on, I'm not going to take it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I said, I listened to it twice today and, you know, just loved it, but also thought that some of it sounded more dated than other parts of it um, for reasons, some of which I've said. And, uh, you know, but, but that's that's just something I've begun to feel in the last couple of years. So I don't know. I don't know what that is or why, you know, hmm. uh, I had always taken the point of view that with, you know, if you put on an old Herman's Hermit album and uh, like it or whatever, that that's nostalgia. But if you put on an old Beatles album, it's not nostalgia. It's because it's the Zenith of Western Civ. Um, and I make that distinction, but, you know, lately I've been thinking, okay, um, these first two albums do sound a bit more dated than say Hard Day's Night does, you know, and maybe in 10 years, I'll think Hard Day's Night does too, somehow sonically and compositionally and in every other way, it sounds more timeless than these first two. And yet on each of these albums, there are things that sound timeless to me. I want to, I saw her standing there. Sounds timeless to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, but ask me why doesn't. It's a hard thing to put your finger on. Yeah. You know, because it. it was, it was music created at a time uh, that recorded music sounded like that. Yeah. Pop songs were written and sounded like that. The Beatles couldn't have written Tomorrow Never Knows in 1963. That was impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so don't go looking for it and take what this is. Take it for what it is. But today, 60 years later, uh, it's just different. It's natural. It's naturally going to feel differently. But pair everything away and just pay attention to the songs and how they're written and go, I don't think anyone else... Oh, very few were capable of doing this, right. and this was their first effort. Right. I think another well, another reason it may sound time uh, dated a little to me is that bands are no longer made to record songs in under three minutes. You know, they're not even made to record them in under seven minutes if they don't want to. You know, um, and and that has made everything a lot more expansive. And you could argue, you 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 really could that okay, two minutes. If you can't say it in two minutes, <laughs> maybe it doesn't need to be said. But you know, that's not true. I mean, it's bands like to sort of work things out and have solos and 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 whatever and that is a more modern approach to recording a song than they had available to them in those days and they changed it they they had a hand in why songs are longer or why they can be short or long it doesn't matter you know um but there's something about when i was listening to this today that i thought you know all these songs are so short they don't really get to breathe you know, hmm. except for I saw her standing there. <laughs> but um, yeah, anyway, I think that's enough for me for this year. <laughs> yeah, well, I understand everything that you're saying, but I just know that in, in this is just how I feel, that even if a song sounds like it's from another time, I'm still going to enjoy it as much as I ever have. If I enjoyed it then, I enjoy it now. Uh, a song doesn't have to sound contemporary for me to feel that it's worth my while to listen to it now there's so much music from decades earlier that i like you can listen to a 50s song and know it's coming out of the 50s and it's definitely a 50s sound and i can still enjoy it it's the same as i always have so but that's me 
but you know you're you're making this argument to someone who listens to music from 1300 a lot of the time so well i wouldn't listen to 1300 music but definitely from the 50s <laughs> on. no but yeah yeah but just music from thir- the 1300s are you listening to it in mono or stereo stereo <laughs> see the, the early primitive stereo though was... they were because they were because they had these groups all around the cathedral you know <laughs> so that was definitely stereo it might have been atmos <laughs> all fun. right i think that we've uh we've exhausted this topic <laughs> so why don't we just uh go around the horn and tell everybody just what's going on with us real quick darren We'll start with you. All right. Uh, catch me at WFUV Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Uh, and Saturday afternoons from 1 p.m. to, to 4 p.m. Um, with Beetle Fest. So, again, for those of you who are watching the show prior to the start of the Fest for Beatles fans, uh, which is this coming Friday, uh, the 31st, and Saturday the 1st and 2nd, I'm not going to be on the air Saturday. I am off, and I don't think I'm on the air Monday night after the fest either. Um, But uh, normally speaking, under normal circumstances, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, starting at 10 p.m., and Saturdays, 1 p.m., on 90.7 FM. Uh, If you're outside of the New York metropolitan area, Uh, You could stream at WFUV.org or listen to our app, which you could download. And um, on Facebook, go to Facebook and send me a friend request at Darren DeVivo or go to uh, Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatle Podcaster and click like or follow or whatever. And we'll we'll be in we'll be in touch. And and maybe I'll see some of you this coming weekend at uh, the Fest for Beatles fans. I hope to. Okay, Alan. Okay, um, when I'm not here doing this podcast, I'm in the world of 1975. Um, Wings is just starting out on its British tour, um, and then it will go to Australia and then some European countries, and then record Wings at the Speed of Sound, then come to America. That's what I have in front of me for the next few weeks. Um, <clears throat> And otherwise, um, I'll see you guys at Beetle Fe- Beetle Fest. Uh, oops, Fest for Beetle fans too. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on Facebook um, at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, or on the McCartney Legacy Facebook page. There's also a McCartney Legacy website, and we're on Twitter. You can write to all of us at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. And follow us on Twitter at, at Things We Said Fab. All of these addresses and radio stations and you name it are in the um, description box um, under the YouTube and Podbean versions of this. And um, yeah, so, and also, yeah, we have, we have two Facebook pages, Things We Said Today, Beatles, wait, yeah, things we said today, Beatles radio fans, and things we said today. You can check us out there. And that's it for me. Okay. As for me, my radio program called The Beatles Every Little Thing, um, you can listen to it on demand anytime during the week at WFDU's website. They run the show Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Eastern Time, and then they make the show available for two weeks. You can go to WFDU.FM, look up their archival shows, archival shows, and type in every little thing. And you can listen to two weeks worth of shows there. My latest show, which will be premiering next week, is a little play on words. Since we all know that Paul had his band, Paul McCartney and Wings, I'm doing a Paul McCartney and Strings set in that show. And uh, my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Uh, We will be at the Fest for Beatles fans, as we will hear, too, from things we said today. You can catch us Monday nights, Um, although the next one's going to be a few weeks after the Fest. Um, Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel. 
Uh, don't forget my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. There's Beatles trivia every single week where you can win one out of 10 great prizes like the McCartney Legacy. I still have one copy left of the McCartney Legacy. And uh, the Get Back Blu-ray, uh, Chris Englehart's new book, Beatles Fully Uncovered, Top of the Mountain, The Beatles at Shea, 1965. A whole mess of good prizes you can win on the website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And then my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Um, there'll be some new interviews coming soon, but the last few weeks I've been doing what I call the Ultimate Beatles Trivia Shows and having three contestants in each. And Darren was on my most recent one. So it was. Going to find out if he was a winner in the show at that time. He was with Joe Mayo, Mean Mr. Mayo, from uh, the Talk More Talk podcast, and his own channel, Mean Mr. Mayo, and Larry Graves, who has been on YouTube for many years under the name Canadian Stud Muffin. They're all challenging each other with the latest trivia contest. Maybe if I twist his arm, I can get Alan on the show one of these days. I feel like I would be like Ringo Klaus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I have to make sure all the questions are solo McCartney <laughs> in the seventies. I was, I was very <laughs> nervous before I came on it because I was afraid that I was going to be buried um, because under the gun, trying to come up with the answers to questions when your area of expertise is here, but the questions tend to be coming from here. I was getting flashbacks of a, of a beetle fest from the early 90s i think when i ended up on their game show uh -huh. that name that that beetle game show that they still do mm -hmm. uh and um one year i actually won it all easily the next year um a girl who had to be about 10 years old destroyed me <laughs> because it was all song lyrics okay and so that's she, a weakness for you? Yeah, because I'm like, bing, she's hitting her buzzer already. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I didn't even, the, the guitar solo didn't even end yet. <laughs> um, uh, So I was a, a little afraid that. Uh, it just know, goes to but, show you could be the most knowledgeable Beatle fan in the world. But when everything is timed and you've got like 10 seconds to answer or something like yeah. that, sometimes you may not come up with the answer. Swanee um, River. <laughs> that's right so uh check out the show see how well darren did and there'll be more of those coming soon so that's it for things we said today we hope to see you at the fest for beetle fans this weekend you can see all of us well you can see um alan and darren throughout the whole weekend i'm only there on saturday if you want to see all three of us together we're doing our panel discussing the mccarty legacy book uh that's saturday at 1 p.m okay Thanks to all of you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the show on Please Please Me. Got a lot of anniversaries this year. My God. <laughs> and we'll get to them. Thanks for watching. And hopefully we'll see you soon. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care.